Hi, I'm Eddie Burke. I've been the bartender at the Hollywood Improv for 40 years, and this is my podcast, Eddie's Bar at the Improv. Hey guys, welcome to Eddie's Bar at the Improv podcast, another pandemic edition via Zoom. And today we've got... Zoom, 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 uh, Zoom. <laughs> We're going to Zoom, uh, Zoom. Noise is my guest for the day, Paul Provenza, actor, writer, comedian, author, entertainer, uh, you name it. They, they don't, they've run out of categories for the man. <laughs> I do love Paul. <laughs> How's life? Uh, you know, been better, been worse. I'm, I'm sure that's the answer for just about everybody. Pretty much, as, as long as you're surviving, that's all we can do right now is hanging yeah. in there. Yeah. Well, let's let's get into Paul Provenza. This is your life. <laughs> oh, oh, oh no. just, uh, you have some of the nasty shit. This is going to get boring. Ah, uh, well, we'll see. You'll see what I come up with. You you were uh, you come from my neck of the woods. You were born in the Bronx or raised in the Bronx. I'm from Manhattan. And you you went to one of the most prestigious high schools in the country, Bronx High School of Science. And I, how does that factor into being a goddamn comedian? <laughs> well, you know, uh, you know, stand-up comedy is really just math and physics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, two and two is funny. I like that. I've, I've always laughed at that because I couldn't figure out the answer. Uh, science was a great, great school. Um, you know, I didn't realize it at the time. At the time, I thought it was just another high school, you know. But um, uh, it's funny because there were so many smart people, way smarter than I. I mean, I really I struggled to think I belonged. Uh, so many bright people from every background, black, white, gay, straight, Puerto Rican, Dominican, you fucking name it, you know, Asian. There were so many people. So I grew up, oddly, I grew up in the Bronx uh, and I was surrounded by really, really smart, smart people of all different faiths and backgrounds and yet, the few times I got beat up, I was beat up by Italians and Jews. So <laughs> I, I, I had a very, a very, I had a unique perspective on race, <laughs> even back then in the mid '70s. And my own people were beating me up more than everybody else. That you know, everybody what did was. You do, all, Paul, what what did you do to these people? Oh, uh, you just show up, you know, kids. Yeah, you know, I remember, know. Remember, I, Eddie, you remember in the '70s. Uh, you, everybody was starting a gang for some reason. I remember, I actually associate it. This is a weird thing. But I remember there was some huge television broadcast that got a lot of attention for some reason of West Side Story. And, and the gang thing caught on with a lot of people, but they didn't do a lot of dancing and singing. They just got together to be like... <laughs> I know. I know. When, when, you, when you're brought up in New York and you watch West Side Story... Even when, uh, when I saw it, when it came out, I'm born and raised on the west side of Manhattan in the 90s. And you watch this movie and you go, hey, those guys that were trying to cut me didn't dance before they did it. And, you know, <laughs> and it's like, it was hilarious. You go like, are you serious? Singing and dancing and, and then you cut them? No. It's so weird because there was this, like, like a whole bunch of people it became trendy to be part of a gang, even though it wasn't really a gang. Right. It was the weirdest thing. It was yeah. the strangest thing. It was, it, it was, it was a time when I, I think you're right. It was main, basically a, a trendy thing. You know? Yeah. See, when, when I, I'll just a little aside, when I grew up a few years before you in the sixties back there, we had groups, we had to walk down the street in groups, gangs. You did not walk down our streets alone if you wanted to make it or with your money or your books or whatever because you would get beat up and some gang would come by. They didn't care, you know? Yeah, so in the, when I started hanging out at the New York Improv, 
uh, was the mid seventies. I was uh, I was going there while I was in high school because you know they didn't they didn't check ID. They really didn't care. I mean, I was oh, yeah. sixteen years old, you know, going to the improv at least once or twice a month uh, before I started, you know, doing it myself, which I was 17 by the time I started doing it myself. But um, I used to go all the time. And the improv on 44th and 9th was like, uh, I remember Mark Schiff used to have a, Mark Schiff used to have a great joke. He'd say, New York is great. You get anything you want. Uh, you can get uh, hookers. Uh, you can get women hookers on 10th Avenue. You can get men hookers on 9th Avenue. You can get men dressed as women on 8th Avenue. You can get horses dressed as dogs on 9th and 7th Avenue. You can get dogs dressed as pigs on 6th Avenue. And that's what it was like. We would leave the uh, the improv because, uh, you know, back then it used to stay open until 4 in the morning or the last member left. Mm -hmm. And in the winters, there were always a couple of hookers and pimps hanging out in the back just to get out of the cold having a drink. Uh, so it was open till four in the morning. And I realized then that to go all the way back to my house in the Bronx would take me just as long if I got on the train at four in the morning as if I got on the train at like 630 in the morning when when full service was going on. Right. So a couple of um, Freddie Stoller used to he lived in uh, Coney Island. So it's the same situation for him, except going south. I was waiting for the trains to go north. He was waiting for the trains to go south. And the two of us realized you know, we could be waiting on a platform for two hours or we could just wander around and make each other laugh. So we used to wander through Times Square. It, the most surreal. Imagine going into, you know, the live sex shows with Freddie Stoller <laughs> at o'clock in the morning at night where maybe neither one of us got up on stage or anything like that. And Freddie used to go. We go to those those live sex booths in Times Square where like they were in a circle and there was a live girl in the middle. And you'd put your quarters in and the little boots would go up. So it was a circle around the woman. And uh, uh, so Freddie would go, you get in this booth. I'd get in one booth and he'd go all the way around and go to the other booth. And he'd go, okay, drop your quarters. And he'd, <laughs> things would go up. And the girl in the middle, she would do it for tips. She would do whatever you wanted her to do. But Freddie decided that, you know, if he didn't get stage time, he decided this was his stage time. So he would start doing material. Like, through this girl's legs, she'd be squatting and dancing the movement, and he'd be trying out jokes on her. <laughs> and oh. that would go on for like an hour before we'd go, okay, we can grab the train home again. It was the most bizarre time in New York City. Oh, I, I can imagine it, it. You know, back then, things were just so different. Things didn't, you know, people weren't as, uh, what's the word, uh, hung up about all these things and it's like you know you run into a hooker you run into a hooker now you run into a hooker you better go away because somebody's taking your picture with them and it was just <laughs> a, a whole other thing but how did you start getting up as a comedian at the age of 17 at the improv well i really just you know i used to watch uh, all the comics on tv and they'd be on the tonight show or or any other talk show and they would always get asked, where did you get your start? And almost every person would say at some point, the improv. Mm -hmm. And so I literally, when I was, you know, like 14 years old, I just went to the phone book and I looked up the improvisation on 44th Street. And I called him and I said, you know, hey, um, um, how do you become a comedian? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, well, you know, we have, uh, we have audition nights. And you come and you went and explained it to me. You wait online for hours. You wait online. And then, you know, uh, you just go up and you do five minutes. I think it was five minutes back then. Uh, and, uh, you know, you just keep doing that until you pass. And um, so I started going and hanging out on the line. And at the time, it was literally first, you know, the first person who arrived was the first person in line. And you had to stay there all day. Right. Until the place opened, management showed up at maybe around 7 p.m. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would get there at like 11 in the morning thinking, uh, this is gonna, uh, I'm, I'm going to be good. And there would already be like 20 people that had been there since like 5 in the morning or some nonsense. <laughs> you, were, you were late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and so I did that for a few times, you know, and, um, and then eventually I, I, I did actually pass those auditions. But... In the intervening years, I went away to school. I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and I used to drive back and forth between Philly and New York on like three-day weekends or holidays, or if I had any you know spare time, I would just drive that you know 
three hour drive more than that actually uh to new york and um and wait online uh mm -hmm. on days and um but while i was at penn uh i was doing all these little talent shows you know anytime they had any sort of a talent show or something i would get up and i and i would do stand up and at the time this is we're talking i i started at penn in 75 and they had a rat skeller on campus because back then on the heels of the vietnam war when people were going why are we sending people off to die but they can't have a That's beer right. mm -hmm. the drinking age was 18. so we actually had a rat skeller on campus and um, the people that I got up at a talent show there once, and they said, you know, you're really good. You want to do this every Saturday night. <laughs> so I was like, fuck yeah. So I would go up and do, you know, an hour of material every week. And mostly it was stuff about going to school or stuff about, you know, more immediate stuff and inside jokes and all that sort of stuff. But it gave me a lot of um, performance time. And it sort of gave me a, a, a time on stage to learn how to do a lot of things and feel a lot of things. So by the time I started going back to the improv, to the auditions, I had a lot more stage experience than most of the other people online. Right. So while I was at Penn, I did a trip up to New York and, and did the audition. And uh, sure enough, Mr. Chris Albrecht one day said, all right, you can start hanging out here. And I thought, cool, I'm going to be a comedian. But then once you pass auditions, I didn't get on sometimes from a month, six weeks at a time before you could get on because it went by seniority. So whoever had passed oh. the auditions first would get on regardless of when they showed up. So if somebody came up to me and it was usually around like two or three in the morning that somebody would say, okay, you're up next. If somebody walked in the door, even as I was being introduced, if somebody walked in the door who had passed auditions a week before me, oh, God. they would get up first and you get bumped. So sometimes months would go by without getting up on stage, but I was able to be able to get on stage at the University of Pennsylvania and get, you know, get, get more and more experience as time went on. And then by the time I got out of college, which was 79, I went into it full time and uh, was already kind of sort of established at the improv. And then it was just a question of just, you know, taking off. So it really was something I did just as a lark. And I it really, I literally got on the phone and said, um, how do you become a comedian? Yeah. And, <laughs> oh, and here I asked that question today, you would get cursed out, you know that, on the phone. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, uh, you've left out a part that I find very fascinating. While you were at Penn, you got you took a leave of absence for a year and went to london as, as a member of what is it, the royal academy of dramatic arts yes I, I would that that's uh that takes a lot of you know i i you know you you just don't call them and say i'm coming you know yeah, no, that, that was a, a cool cool thing and that came from the fact that you know, Penn is a is a, a a fine institution. I have nothing, you know, to say against it. Uh, but I had friends who were going to Brown or Cornell or Yale, other Ivy League schools, uh, a bunch of state schools. I had friends from high school who were at all these different schools, and the ones that were like into theater and drama and performing and all that sort of stuff, they were doing things and getting credit for it. But there was nothing like that at Penn. Everything that you did in terms of doing shows, doing you know theater groups or any of that sort of stuff, student performing arts, were all extracurricular. And so I was sitting there going, I'm spending really most of my time doing all this extracurricular stuff, and my friends are getting college credit for it at their schools. So I was like, man, I, I kind of chose the wrong school because when I went when I went to Penn, I figured I wasn't going to do this for a living. I just, you know, was, my, my dad had just died and he was one of those, you know, get your degree and get a, get something to fall back on so you never have to worry about, you know, about it. And, and um, so I went to Penn thinking that I would go to law school because that was another uh, thing that I really loved. I was particularly interested in constitutional law. And so I was entirely expecting to go to Penn and then, you know, apply to law schools. But about halfway through, I, I suggested this can't, I can't, I have to try this. I have to try doing the impossible. Uh, so I was really unhappy there. 
So when the opportunity arose to study at RADA through um, a, a weird sort of adjunct program is, you know, those, those kind of hookups between schools get kind of weird labyrinthine. But um, so when the opportunity came, I took it and that was kind of my decision to go into show business. I knew that when I came back from studying at RADA that I would, uh, I was definitely not going to go to law school. Uh, While you were there, you, you had a, uh, you accomplished something that most Americans don't accomplish. And that was, you played Romeo on the London stage. And yeah. It was weird. Very rare for an American to play that role on a London stage. Yeah, uh, for better or worse. I, I, so, I don't well, think, Paul, I don't you know, think I'm not going to let anybody to that, see that Paul, I'm not going to let you slough that off negatively. That's a <laughs> hell of a fucking accomplishment. Are you well, kidding? It, it was um, uh, studying at RADA was really intense. I mean, the whole, uh, I guess it's sort of legendary. And this is true at a lot of, you know, some American schools uh, for theater, uh, like, you know, Texas School of the Arts is, is really phenomenal. And, you know, there's a lot of great institutions in America, too. But I also wanted to travel. And it was an opportunity that presented itself that I didn't have at other places. So, um, but the whole... Uh, you know, the whole process at RADA with any young acting student that is um, privileged enough to be there is basically destroy them. The whole premise is like military. It's like break right. you down to where you have zero self-confidence. You don't know what is right, what is wrong. You have no idea if you have any talent or you're just wasting everybody's time. It's brutal. Brutal, brutal, brutal. And then once they've stripped you of, of, of all ego, <laughs> and and all security, you know, you start to put stuff back together in a way that's a little bit different and 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 lends itself to to real artistry. Uh, so it was a really really a, a really brutal experience. I mean, I would come home every day going, I'm I'm crazy. This is this is the biggest mistake of my life to think that I could ever do this. And so halfway through that you know, experience, I, I found a, a local theater company that was doing a, a production and I started to, uh, it was like a rep company. And I just auditioned because I was like, I got to see if I can, I got to see what this feels like in action because I'm being so beaten up through the process of, uh, you know, studying with them mm -hmm. uh, that I was like, I have to, I have to see if I, if this machine even flies at all. So that's why, that's what motivated me to do that. And yeah, I ended up, I ended up, playing Romeo with all these British actors and a couple of other things as well. Um, you know, and I yeah, had to that, work. That's quite, that's, that's a, look, that's a hell of a, an accomplishment. And I, I understand what you're saying because I spent a year at the high school of performing arts in New York. Did you? Yeah. From back in the day when, uh, in the uh, sixties. Right? Um, but it, it was the same thing where they, they beat the shit out of you. In, <laughs> mentally about acting or what have you and personally i couldn't take it <laughs> so I, I that's why i only spent one year there but uh to to do that to have that experience at the royal academy of dramatic arts there aren't many people first of all that can get in there i don't care what your connections are because once you're in there you have to back it up it's kind of like your friend getting you an audition okay I can get you an audition, not a problem. But you, you know, you're the one yeah. that's going to yeah. have to back it up. Well, this this was a program that was it was um, uh, what do you call a um, an adjunct program, which was it, it was um, it, it was part of the Royal Academy, but it was a specific program for American students that was outside the typical RADA thing, and it was the first. Uh, year and a half of Rada's three-year course in a year, and um, and I was thinking of, of of staying there after that year. I was thinking of staying there, so I went through the ordinary uh, audition process to try and become a legit member of the uh, you know a legit student of Rada per se, as opposed to just this adjunct program. And I had gotten pretty far uh, through the auditions. I think I was down to the last cut. Uh, really for very few spaces. I mean, there were maybe like two or four spaces for American, you know, set aside for uh, mm -hmm. American students. Um, and I'd gotten pretty far and I backed out at the last minute because my father had just died about a year and a half before. 
And I was feeling like, you know, my mom, my mom's alone in New York. My sister was already out of the house. And, and so I just didn't feel like I wanted to be away any longer. So I pulled myself out of it. So I don't know if I would have actually been accepted into their program or not, but I did come pretty close. Uh, and then, came well, back. That, you know, to get down to that part, to, to be one of the last four, three, yeah, four, whatever, that's a hell of an accom accomplishment. You know? Yeah, no, I, 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 felt, I felt that for sure. Uh, and, and that made me feel better. And when I came back, I did my last year at Penn, um, but also was performing a lot more. And so much of what, actually, to be honest, a lot of what I learned at RADA still to this day, I'll be on a set for something, or, or especially doing plays, whatever, and all of a sudden something will snap in my head and I'll go, oh, that's what they meant back in 78. Or whatever. <laughs> oh, that's right. what that means. Now I understand that. It's so yeah. fascinating. That, that is so interesting because that's so true. You know, as, as, as an actor, I've experienced that. You go with, I spent the summer with Stella Adler, mm -hmm. uh, studying with her. And, and, you know, there were a few things that she taught us that I hadn't <laughs> learned at that point. And then, you know, the few jobs that I, I've been fortunate enough to have, and you do something and you go just like that. It's like, oh, <laughs> that's why she said that. And that's why she was showing us this, that, or the other. It wasn't just a matter of, of like, well, you need to have somewhere to come from. I mean, you, you have to have a backstory for yourself, you know, and, and you have to come from somewhere. You don't just walk through the door and expect to become the uh, comical sidekick, the killer, whatever. That's got to start before you open that door. Yeah, it also it also seems like just in general, it seems like there's a certain passive aspect to learning about any art or doing any art. There's a certain passive aspect that you can't control. That's I don't know, call it inspiration or call it uh, I don't know what to call it, but literally times where you have little tiny epiphanies and you go, oh, yeah. this piece of work that is interesting to me, even right. you know. Like, wow, this surprised me. And that's one of the things that, I, that I, I'm really focused on a lot in a lot of the stuff I'm doing now, because I'm doing a lot of stuff. Pretty much everything I'm doing is on spec, because apparently, uh, you know. Nothing's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, well, I'm not just talking about since the pandemic. I'm talking about, like, for the past five years. Uh, um, uh, and so I've just been focusing on things that surprise myself, you know, things where I don't really know what I'm doing, what's the outcome of this. I mean, I'm working on a documentary project right now, that every day is is a little bit of a revelation to me in it, and that's exciting. You know, I used to be very sort of sure about w what I was trying to accomplish and how I was going to go about it, and, and you know, and go through that process with with this do idea. You back, do you look back sometimes at those experiences and say to yourself how lucky you are that you did do that? You know, like Rada and stuff like that. Oh, for sure. All the time. I mean, even things that even there are things, you know, choices I've made and, and, and things that have come my way that I fucked up, you know, yeah. and even those like I look back on and just go, oh, but that took me to this place and that took me to that place. And I don't necessarily even mean career wise, although sometimes I just mean in terms of of your own sort of artistic impulse, you know, um, that's one of the things that's kind of kind of been weird for me is that, that because I had so many interests in so many different directions, um, uh, it became kind of hard to pigeonhole me. And as you know, mm -hmm. this loves having things in nice, neat little boxes. Um, so it became, don't they, don't they love that in Hollywood? Yeah. You know, like there was a whole, a whole bunch of people in my career that know me as a stage actor that's how they think of me. And then there's a whole bunch of people that think of me as a, an interviewer. And then there's a whole bunch of people that think of me as a stand up. And then there's a whole bunch of people, but not really a whole lot of overlap. Right. It's funny so, how, how, how Hollywood is that way. And, and it's probably, you know, it's probably life. It's just that we know Hollywood and right, that's, yeah. it's probably in every other business, but the world tends to pigeonhole you, like you said. It's like, oh, I know Paul Provenza. Yeah, he's that interview guy or, or whatever. And that I think it just makes it more comfortable for people to do that. And yeah. 
dealing with 10 million uh, pieces of meat, you know, mm -hmm. for every gig. And they got to look at all kinds of things that have nothing to do with who you are and what your talent is, you know? Oh, a no, lot that, that's 100% true. That's like one of the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that having been on the other side of the table, having produced things, having cast people, having, you know, hired people, I know now, I know the 10 million variables that are behind, you know, every decision that really very little to do with is this person competent and can they accomplish the job you know there's a lot of other stuff involved uh and so that was kind of eye-opening but all of that ultimately served to me getting to the place where i'm at now which i was just kind of talking about which is letting go of outcome instead of instead of trying to control what what's going on artistically creatively I just go with it and and nine times out of ten i'm surprised with where i end up but happily so because it's a surprise <laughs> you know <laughs> well you you know you you've directed i assume you want to direct more um and the fact that you know you you said you're doing a documentary all i mean all these things it's like how do you keep it together in the sense that like okay right now i'm in my director phase you know, uh, or I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm, I've got an acting role for now. Uh, you know, this is what I'm going to do. How do you keep it in that head and go like, okay, everything else is on the side right now. I'm Paul Provenza, the director. When I'm, when I'm working on any particular project, whether I'm casting something or I'm directing something or producing whatever it is, I really, I try to really focus down hard on that. I try to stay immersed in that. Mm -hmm. When those projects end, that you know, I, I go crazy. Right. I go completely crazy because I don't know what my next step is going to be. I don't. My career, such as it is, <laughs> has never been a straight trajectory. It's always been all over the map, and um, that used to frustrate the hell out of me. Uh, but eventually I just got to the place where I just go, well, that's, that's what it is, you know, but that, that's, I'd like to ask you that question, you know, how do you deal like, like, you know, I, when I was young, when I started doing, uh, this stuff, uh, particularly stand up, you know, I had all these sort of visions and fantasies and dreams of where it would take me and what I would like, you know, where I would like it to take me and, mm -hmm. and, you know, the kind of life I'd like to leave. But as you grow older, and older and you get more experience on the planet more experience in show business and more experience as an artist as a performer all that stuff shifts and changes and you know like i'm curious for you you know you, you had a background you studied this you work as an actor but you know is your life at all like what you thought it would be and is it disappointing and if so did you have to let go of dreams? And, and, and that's really an interesting world to examine for every one of us. That, that's very true. And it is very interesting. And I think for me, uh, it's changed drastically as I, as I got older. You know, I came in with, this is funny, a seven year plan. I was gonna attend bar for, for seven years and by then I'll have a series, you know, or something right. like that. Obviously there's been a lot of seven years, but, and no, uh, no series yet, but my, you know, my outlook kept changing as times changed for me. It, you, God, that's such a good question. And you have, you know, I, I've, I've experienced, I've been fortunate enough to work a little bit as an actor and every time i have i say to myself this is why i'm doing it because you're you know it's the energy the life everything is just what you want it to be and yeah was that my dream yes is that my dream yes why not it's still i mean you know i may look like i'm gonna die but i'm, I'm not <laughs> I'm still, I'm still there. There, there are roles for older people, but um, I also realize that <clears throat> you can't take things personally in this business. You know, the yeses and the noes. We people, I honestly feel that most people are well intentioned, 
they they just they're well intentioned because they want to make themselves look bigger in your eyes they'll go like you know the next project i produce paul i'm going to have you direct and you know you go away with from that with whatever you do and then you think about the fact well you know they really are are at that moment they meant that and you know it may never happen and most of the time it doesn't but you know there everybody is really uh, you know pulling for you pulling for each other pulling for themselves and you just you really are in control of what you want to think you know you're not in control of of how you're you know whether or not you're going to get a job or something like that right you are in control of how you think about that and right and deal with the reality and going into i mean i can't tell you how many auditions we go into and you're shocked when you find out as to why you got a job why you right. got that particular job and and one very uh prime example that always sticks out for me was you remember the tv show the white shadow sure yeah uh okay. uh, uh, uh tk yeah. carter who tk carter yes yeah anyway um <clears throat> i went in on an audition and uh what's a, i think it was kevin hooks was one of the kids one uh -huh. of the ball players uh -huh. anyway I go in on an audition and I can't remember what it was for, but there were like half a dozen producers, whatever, sitting in the room along with the director who happens to have been Kevin Hooks. And so I do my thing and I'm walking out. And as I'm walking out, I said, you know, um, excuse me, but I have to tell you how much I loved you on The White Shadow. And he said, thank you very much. And so on, blah, blah. all the other guys in there looked at him like, you were an actor, uh. you, know, like, you know, and, and to me, that's the reason I got the job. You know, we're <laughs> it's very talking, possible. Yes. We're not talking about a, a huge role to begin with. It was a couple of lines, but you know, these little things that, pop out of nowhere, that's the business. And you start to recognize that and you also start to say like, it's not personal. Right, I'll tell you something that I did learn. Uh, and I learned it later than I wish I had. But you know something that actually makes a really big difference? Like, you know, so many roles come down, so many gigs come down to you know, being on the fence about one person or another or one of three or four people, you're not real sure. And, you, and, and then you start to drill down to stuff that's not obvious. And I realized that a lot of those decisions come down to something really sort of simple and human, which is what's this presence going to be like on the set? Right. And it's like you're a big star where, you know, you're the money and they have to cater to your every whim. And if you want to be a psychotic asshole, they have to go along with it. You know, if, if you're not that person, but you're just an actor, you know, somewhere else in this picture, they really do sit down and go, is it going to be a pain in the ass to deal with this person yep. or not? Yep. Is this person going to, going to be a positive influence on the set mm -hmm. or are is it going to be drama and nonsense and shit like that? And it's like, if you're not a fucking superstar where, you know, you're the money no matter what, and they're going to come to you no matter how big an asshole you are. If you're not that person, and that's a tiny percentage of us, it really does <laughs> often come to, is this person going to make life better or worse for everybody else involved in this project? Well, I'm going to give you a perfect example of that. Because what you, that, that being said, it is 100% true. I was shooting a commercial once. I forget what, again, what the spot was. And I'm sitting on a break. I'm sitting around with the advertising people and, and the director and they're all talking and I'm being smart and keep my mouth shut because, you know, I'm just there. 
And one of them said, uh, how come you hired uh, so-and-so again? Not me. This is another actor. And they said, well, quite simply, he's very professional. He does the job every time. He, you know, he's never a problem. He shows up on time. He does his thing. I, we never have to worry about him being a prima donna. And so when a role fits him, I'll hire him because I'm not going to have to deal with any shit. And that's yeah. your, you. what you say is, is 100% true. Uh, yeah, and, and, and you develop a reputation like that, you know, yeah. as producers or, or, or directors, if they, you know, if you're not somebody of a huge profile, they'll talk to each other. Well, you know, what do you think of this person? Was this person good to work with, you know? Mm-hmm. Now, sorry, a nightmare. And there's three other candidates they're thinking about. You're the first one out of the pack, you know? Right. Um, I, I will tell you, though, that um, I, I had an interesting sort of negative backlash to all of that. Uh, I ended up uh, taking over a lead role on a series. And there was somebody that had been on this series for quite some time. Uh, so obviously, they were locked in. And... Um, very difficult. Somebody who was very, very problematic, very diva-like, very full of drama all the time, right? So I came into this series and I was doing my thing. And at the time, because I was on a series, I was also getting a lot of gigs, you know, your profile goes up and all of a sudden the live gigs, yep. stand-up gigs become more valuable and, and offers, you know, start coming in more and more. So because I was working on this series, you know, all week, I could only do weekend gigs. And I would try and book these weekend gigs around my shooting schedule. And they were generally, you know, Friday and Saturday nights were the big money gigs for corporates or gigs where, you know, they're like, oh, this guy's on TV. This would be great, you know. Um, and I kept having to cancel my Friday gigs because I found myself working every Friday till the last shot of the day. And that was just not enough time to get to a gig I had to do if it was not, you know, local. And I went to the producers at one point and I said, listen, I said, is it at all possible when you're doing the production schedule, if I give you advance, if I say to you, hey, I got a good opportunity coming this Friday night, can I be done by Thursday? Can we, can we arrange something like that? Is it possible? to do that. And one of the producers took me aside in private and said, listen, I'm going to tell you exactly why you're not getting any Fridays off. He said, because you know, Fridays, the crew is exhausted. The crew has been working their asses off all week long. And we realized that you show up on time, off book, you know, no drama. You get the job done. We're in, we're out. He said, the crew actually asked for this other person, the diva, who was already on the series. <laughs> they actually said, can we keep them off of Fridays so we can all get home and spend times with our families and not have to deal with this drama uh-huh. every Friday. And so they ended up putting all my stuff on you Fridays. Know, Fridays as possible because the crew was just, it's so nice to not have to deal with drama on the last day of the week. Yeah. So we get a weekend off or we get a nice take a breath. And so that was actually driven by the fact that somebody else on the show was an asshole. Right. And I would show up and they knew they could get, they could get out early on Fridays because I never had to, you know, I was off book. I was like you said, professional, you know, prepared, all that stuff. And, and, that's how much it was appreciated. It was appreciated so much that I got screwed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, you really, I, I understand what you're saying, but you can really look back on that and kind of say to yourself like, well, that's really, you know, it's a very big compliment because it was. Exactly. And that's what made it okay. That's what made it wow. okay for me to forego all of that Friday night live gig money because yeah. I was like, all right. This is the price you pay for being, you know, professional and, and not creating drama everywhere. It means and I that- guarantee you, whoever these people were, whatever it is you were doing, 
you stayed in their minds whenever anything came up. You know? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of those producers went on to create another monster hit show and asked me to come in on it right out of the gate. Unfortunately, I was in the middle of doing another project and I couldn't. Oh. I'm kicking myself in the ass over that because it was a fucking great project they went on to produce. Um, but they thought of me right away. And that's, that's what mattered. Yeah, and then the, that is, they'll, they'll keep the, the very good uh, images of the people they want and the very bad images of the other people. Yeah. So, you know, and, and the, those of us in between, oh, okay, if we got something, we'll call you. But it, and it, it's so much more important to leave with that professionalism and show that professionalism because it's kind of like, Fuck, and you know, I got a your your story is a perfect example of actors. They will work with you. Another a god, I I'll give you another one. I at one point I studied at uh, the Strasberg Institute for a little while when uh -huh. I first came to Hollywood. Uh and there was a story that went around there and the story was, you know, the Strasberg is the method and you need time to prepare for your whatever. And the story going around was this guy went in for an audition, one of the students or whoever, and there's the three people in there, the, the director, producer, whatever. And he sits down in a chair and says to them, can you give me a minute? And he turns the chair around, I guess getting into character and he turns back around after a minute or two and he says, okay, I'm ready. And they, they go, thank you very much. And you're done. <laughs> and the reason was, this is a camera job. It's, I forget, a movie or TV. We can't give you five minutes to prepare Ah. When when we say uh, action or you know whatever, you have to be there, you know. Right. So the lesson was prepare before you get there. Yeah. Well, uh -huh. look, I've learned that the most important part of your job is that audition. You need to be better on the audition than the actual performance. Yes, because you don't really get direction on the audition. Right. When you get the gig, then they work with you. Yeah. But yeah. It, the, the thing is, they want to see, they tell you, you know, you learn a, as a student studying acting, you kind of learn that, well, you know, you don't have to show them the finished product. You need right. to show them that you're capable of it. Well, that's very wrong. You need to show them you know, unless it's, it's like you said, a very big person showing them a, a huge role, part of a huge role, you can get away with that. Right. But anybody else, you better come in 110% prepared and hitting, hitting your, your spots with whatever it is you have to do. Because when it gets to also, if you, when it comes time to shoot, you know, you get direction, but... Not if you have a, a smaller role. Yes, <laughs> correct. All of a sudden, they go, one of my first jobs, they go like, all right, action. And I'm thinking to myself, well, doesn't the director talk to me or something like that? Right, right. No, he doesn't. He doesn't give a shit. What he, what he wants from you is carry on the, on the role, carry on yeah. the story. Right. And Everybody around the stars has to be... Uh, self-contained everybody right. around there so when they cast they're going to cast the person that naturally is closest to that role or that attitude or whatever exactly. so that they they don't have to even focus on that right well here's an interesting thing uh, i learned this about auditioning is that nine times out of ten you know actors will go what do they want what do they want how you know i'm going to approach this as a way as think of what they want and the truth of the matter is if you go in and you give them something that they didn't even know they wanted, mm -hmm. they're generally like, oh, cool. So the answer to it all is 
Forget about what they want. Make your own bold choices and tell them why they should hire you. And yes. I truly believe that, you know, it's as effective as anything else. I mean, sometimes you're on the money. Sometimes you go in and you give them something and it's just like they can see it plugged right into what their vision is. Other times you do it and it's the complete opposite of what their vision is. And it was, it, it, it's absolutely not going to happen. But the ratio, I think, is much better if you go in making some bold choices that they then have to say, okay, well, this person at least made bold choices. Mm -hmm. Then in, that's usually when you, get an, when you get an audition, that's usually when they'll go like, okay, let's try it a different way. And, you know, whenever yeah. they do that in an audition, you're in good shape. <laughs> right. Because it means they're willing to see if you can give them something that's closer to what their concept is. And it, that's, that's great. It's great. And then it's just a question of, oh, yeah, this that's person came with this kind of a concept, they took direction, brought it to this kind of a concept, this is a pro. <laughs> I, guess, I laugh at that because you say, try it a different way. And that's such a common thing, you know, to, in, in an audition for somebody to go, try it a different way. And, and I had an audition for, as a hostage negotiator in, uh, oh God, in some TV series, and the lines were very simple, something like, uh, all right, John, the, 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 I'm, I'm coming in, I'm unarmed, something like that. And uh, I do it and uh, whatever, and everybody's just looking and I'm going like, well, is there something else you wanted me to do or another way to do this? Although I don't think there is enough way to do that, you know, and it, it was that simple, you yeah. know, it's, yeah, yeah. you're not going to go, all right, John, here I come. You yeah. Know? That's the, like, that's why those roles, those roles where you just have a couple of lines in one scene, those are the hardest. And what they're really looking for is the person that, that they want to walk in the room. Exactly. You know, I can and, give you direction and I can play around. That's why those roles are the hardest because you, yeah, even, the, you know, you know sometimes that, and those things are tight. Yep. And they're just there to, those roles are there to carry the story on. If, if they weren't there for that reason, they wouldn't be there. Right. You know, they don't need to pay more people. Right. You know, exactly. And, yeah. Un unless you're, you're somebody's, uh, you know, great nephew and we need to give him a line or something like that. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very, very tough business. And I think most of us are at odds with ourselves as we perform and as we audition thinking like, no, nah, they don't like me, you know, they don't fuck them. And you go like, well, I once had a casting director say, say to me like, you know, you actors don't understand. We want to like you. Yeah. We want you to do well. If you don't do well, we look bad because the director is going to go like, well, why did you bring him in to audition? He's so terrible. So it's not us against you. We're all in this together. Right, 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 right. Yeah. You've been That's on, really, on a, I mean, look. I think most actors are somewhat damaged people anyway. So you, know, you, take, <laughs> you take damaged people and you put them in a world that's all about damaging people. <laughs> there's no thoughts about that uh, uh, at all. I think there's like, t you know, there's <laughs> there's a very thin line between acting and and insanity. <laughs> you know, it's like and and a lot of people in the in any art is it's is like that. And a lot of people well, one of the reasons why stand up was was, uh, you know, so special uh, uh, and why you find a lot of stand ups who are actually like fucking brilliant actors. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, Jamie Foxx is amazing. I don't care what anybody says. He's amazing. You know, and, oh, and uh, I, uh, yeah. all the same, all the same ingredients for what make a great actor make a very special comedian as well. You know, it's not always one to one, but but they can line up pretty often. But the thing about stand-up is that it's one of the few uh, arenas where you really do have complete control. There's nobody telling you what you should do. I mean, ultimately, it boils down to is the audience connecting with you and they're going to spend money to come and see you. But that's all up to you. 
Mm-hmm. There's nobody that's going to make an audience come and see you except you. It's how good is your work? How funny are you? How interesting are you? How many people connect to you? Whatever that is, for better or worse, the bottom line is there's no agents. There's no you know managers. There's no producers. There's no director. There's no studio. It's like it's all you. And that is a refreshing counterbalance to what it's like trying to work as an actor, unless you're a star. Right. And, I, and <laughs> your feedback is immediate. You don't get reviews in the morning. Right. The reviews are right there. Right. It's, it's you're either doing fine or you're not, or you, everything is uh, mediocre, whatever. Everything is right there. You, you find yeah. out right then and there which is probably why I could never do stand up and never do. I don't want to know the truth. <laughs> I'm the one that can't handle. You can't handle the truth. That's right. I can't handle the truth. So I'm not going up there. I'm not doing stand up. That's why one of the reasons I, I like admire stand ups. It's kind of like, you know, whether somebody is a jerk or good or bad or not, it's, it's so hard to do that, to, to get up, the the nerve so to speak and be willing to get undressed in front of a hundred two hundred two strangers and try to be funny and it's you know you know better than me it it's not easy you probably have to get knocked on your face a number of times before you even get one joke to work sometimes. Yeah, that's why, you know, I'm sure people have said this on, on, on your podcast here. Um, you know, they say it's a minimum of 10 years before a comic can really find their voice. And, and I, I would say that's roughly true. But what that means really is just it takes that, man, it takes that much stage time for you to have gotten enough variables to know that you can take whatever comes along. Yeah, you know, that's really what it is, and 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 over that time you start to shift and grow and realize what you you know h- how to communicate the things you want to communicate, what which which ways are funny or what the sty- certain stylistic stuff. You grow as a human being. All that gets incorporated at the same time, and so you know that ten years is what allows you to say, hey, it doesn't matter what the external circumstances are. I know what I'm about, and I know that I'm going to figure out a way to accomplish it. You know. That makes me think of, of another question in your case. It's like you've been doing this for a long time and the world of comedy has changed immensely. Boy, and I... the, the, yeah, you used to have to pay your dues. You don't have to pay your dues anymore, unfortunately. You're because of social media. Everything has changed quite a bit. Do you see that change in the world of comedy in terms of like, you know, so many people and I do, I, so many people just aren't funny. They just have followings because of YouTube or, or Twitter or what have you. And it's, it's, it's changed. You don't have to be funny. You just have to be known, (laughs) you know? That's true, but I think I think generally most of the people who sustain are genuinely funny and in different ways, in ways that maybe are are not clear to us not having come from this generation. But I think it's a double-edged sword. I think on one hand, I feel all the time, I feel like, holy shit, I wish I were coming up now because there's so many opportunities. I remember you, we'd be sitting around at the improv shooting the shit with other comics and coming up with all these great ideas and go, wouldn't it be funny if this, and how about if you do that? And I got this idea for a movie, whatever. And now it's like, wow, we could actually have done all of those things if we were alive now, you know? And so I feel on one hand like, wow, I wish I were just starting out now because the possibilities are so huge. But then on the other hand, I feel like, wow, I'm glad I'm not starting out now because how do you ever get through this din? How do you, how, how do you, it's just so confusing and baffling and, and, and uh, I don't know. But I, 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 I kind of feel on one hand, it's the greatest time to start out as a comic. And on the other hand, it's the worst time to start out as a comic. Like the idea of everything you do being, you know, scrutinized under a microscope, mm-hmm. everything being filmed and recorded and put online and everybody gets a chance to tell you that they think you're an asshole or they don't like what you said or all that sort of stuff. It's like, wow, man, that must be brutal. In fact, it was Bo Burnham 
who said this to me, he even said it uh, um, on the episode of The Green Room that he was on with uh, Gary Shandling and Mark Marin and Ray Romano and Judd Apatow. He said, like, you know, I'm really tired of other comics coming up, you know, older comics coming up and saying, oh, these kids, they don't pay their dues. They don't pay their dues. Look, look at this guy, Bo Burnham. He just, you know, made it from an internet following, some goofy thing, stuff he did on the internet. He didn't really pay his dues. And he said, you know what? You try reading thousands and thousands and thousands of YouTube comments and you tell me you're not paying dues. <laughs> <laughs> he was right. It was interesting. Yeah. I was like, wow. It's Imagine. funny, you make, you make, as I think about like when I was starting out, some of the crap that I did as I was just learning how to do it, and some of the bad choices I made as I was just figuring out what the hell stand up comedy is and who I am, and, and even as, as a person, just being a young person turning into a human being, you know, I think, could you imagine if you had to be responsible for every fucking bad idea or decision or thought or attempt you had at doing something could you imagine if you had to fucking respond to it yeah oh, that I, must be a nightmare it's very interesting that you said that because i like i've always said that if i was starting out today i wouldn't but you make me change my mind about that in because there there are so many more outlets in the sense that if you have an idea good, bad, or whatever, you can get it out there. And back in the day, you know as well as I do, forget. Yeah, the ideas just yeah. went away. That's it. It, it wasn't happening unless, uh, unless you knew somebody with a lot of money or a producer, director. You can have the greatest idea in the world, and I it wasn't happening. Sitting around at the improv, shooting the shit with Rick Overton, how, how many dozens and dozens of great video sketches we came up with and they just went away. You know, mm -hmm. Rick, one of those brilliantly inventive people who's always coming up with, you know, and he'll describe something cinematically. So the camera comes across, pans across and then you see this guy that moves in and reveals this. And it's like, oh my God, we could actually do every one of those right now. If we were both in the early 20s right now with our phones, we could do all of these ideas that at the time were fantasies. That's it's right. Really and that's, so actually you and Rick still can do that. Uh, you we, really can. It's we funny. We can now, but we're running out of energy. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem like that to me. It's, uh, but speaking of, since you brought Rick up, you guys are in, I, I don't know what's happening pandemic wise, but you guys are involved in a very interesting show called Set List. Yeah. I, I mean, the whole dynamic of that show, I think is, is phenomenal. Explain it to, to my three listeners. <laughs> <laughs> All right, both you guys need to pay attention. Uh, yeah, set list, and we're doing it now at the Improv on, on Melrose, we're doing it in the, uh, the Improv Lab. Uh, well, I mean, before the pandemic we had been, <laughs> and hopefully we will again. But the premise of it is uh, by the brilliant, brilliant Mr. Troy Conrad, um, he came up with this concept and, and he asked me to do a very early incarnation of it. And I just fell in love with it. And I begged him to partner with me and my producing partner, Barbara Roman. And I, cause I felt, I, I said, you know, every audience needs to feel this and every comedian on the planet needs to, needs to experience this. So we ended up taking it around the world. We've done it all over the world in different languages, uh, we did a series of it in the UK. We did 14 episodes, 14 half hour episodes of it. Uh, Robin Williams was one of the people on it. Uh, Rob, I mean, so many people. It's incredible. Um, uh, but the premise of it is we create a set list and we give it to you on stage and you have to improvise the set that goes with it. You've never seen it before. You and the audience see each prompt together for the first time. So the audience is there going, what the hell is this person going to do? The comedian's going, what the hell am I going to do? And yeah. everybody is in on it. And it's an amazing experience. And comics have said, comics around the world have said, this is the closest you can ever come to your first time on stage. And to feel that kind of, you know, wow, I don't have any answers here. Uh, and, and Eddie, Izzard, Eddie Izzard did it once and stopped in the middle and just said, this is fucking hard. And then continued. <laughs> beautiful. It was beautiful to see, for an audience to see Eddie Izzard going, wow, man, I'm stumped. It was beautiful. So many big, big names have done it and, and unknown comedians. And it's a great equalizer. And we were very careful to make it not a competition so mm -hmm. that the experience of it is just 
the singer, not the song, which was one of the, the sort of themes of the aristocrats, was the idea that this person has this idea. You and the audience, you can sit and think, what would you do with it? Uh, and, and the performer does what they do with it. And no two people are ever going to be the same. And it, it, the prompts are, are really, because um, like a real comedian set list, they're just for the comedian. They won't make any sense to anybody else. It's not like listing track numbers on a record album where you can sort of, okay, those are the titles of the songs. As you know, on a comic set list, they can just be one word that trigger that reminds you about something or that's sort of a key word in the bit. And you know what the bit is. So they're those kinds of like really uh, almost surreal prompts. And, and, and I think uh, that it, it, that whole concept, like you said, it, it's, so close to being your first time on stage and I have I, I gotta tell you this I won't mention the person's name who was sitting at the bar who was waiting to go up for the set list to do, go and he was a, a comedian and whatever and he's just sitting there and I'm, we start to talk and he goes you know I'm, I'm sorry I don't mean to be rude but I'm just trying to go through my head and think of whatever it is they could possibly have me do up there. You know, <laughs> it's like <clears throat> this is this is like uh, going in into a uh, what what did he say? Into an audition with no script, no story, nothing, and then they go, "You're on," <laughs> you know, and that's pretty much what it, it's a unique concept. And, and, and it's so funny because if you, if you have a horrible time doing it, you can't wait to get up and get another shot at it. You know, mm. if you have a great time doing it, you can't wait to get up and have another shot at it. So like, it's like bungee jumping. And I remember, uh, you know who Tim Minchin is? Tim Minchin is a – Tim Minchin. Uh, he's best known for things like he wrote Matilda, the Broadway okay. uh -huh. hit, uh, Groundhog Day, which prior yeah. to the pandemic was yeah. on Broadway and in the West End. Um, but he's also a, a, a comedian and a performer, a musical performer in his own right. Um, uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And he had just done a week of shows at the O2 Arena in London. And like the day after his run finished, he came to do set list at a little basement 90 seat room at the Soho Theater in London. And he's sitting, he had just done a week at the O2, and he's sitting and waiting to go on at set list, and he just texted out, I just came from doing a week at the O2 Arena, and I'm now in the basement, ready to go on doing set list for 90 people, and this is the scariest thing I have ever <laughs> done. It's that kind of thing. It's like I got this weird fascination. Performers know this is like, wow, this is really like pure. There's something very pure about it, and they love it, and they I love it. I can't imagine a single comedian not wanting to do that. You're making me want to do that. No, it's really fun. <laughs> I'm not a comedian. I'm thinking, wow, somebody's going to yell out, you know, an I or you're going to put down an idea and show it up on the board, however you do it, and I got to take it and go with well, it. You know what we do uh, when we do the show live is is to really get the audience in the right headspace, and and because we're very and it's one of the reasons why I think performers are so into it is because we get the audience in that headspace of don't judge people this is about just watching the process this is mm -hmm. about and stuff this is this is almost like an athletic event you know yeah. there is no except there's you know there's no first place or second place this is working out a gym you know and you can sit back and go that's interesting that's not interesting but you can't judge it because nobody is doing anything they normally do here you know mm -hmm. and and so the audience is predisposed to, for, for you to take risks. And that's, I think, another reason, right? Because we had opportunities to do it as a series here in America, but they all wanted it to have some sort of competitive element. And we were like, no, that's exactly the antithesis of yeah. why it works. This works because the performers know they're not being judged. So do you find that doing that, like, let's say in LA, is different from doing that in, uh, you know, Colorado or Texas or nope. whatever. We've done it every. We've done it all I, over. No, the I'm talking. I mean, in in uh, the sense of the audience, and nope, nope. nope. Okay. It's unbelievable. It's another great thing about it is when somehow when you get down to the purity, the 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 comic, the comedians' impulse, why they're even doing.
comedy, you know, to begin with for their lives. Uh, when you get down to that basic, it's almost a universal. And audiences get it. Audiences get that. You know, well, again, we're very careful to make sure we corral the audience into the right headspace. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the things we will often do with an audience is give them an opportunity to try it themselves. You know, to pair up in the audience and say, here's the thing. Each of you just... Just fill 30 seconds talking about whatever you see on that thing. It doesn't even have to be funny. And, and so they get a chance to try it themselves and go, wow, 30 seconds of st random stuff about a thing you just – is actually really kind of hard. And so they get into the experience of doing it. And then by the time the performers come on, they're like, whoa, this is hard. These guys yeah. are fucking ballsy. You know, these, these people, are, they know what they're doing. So it, it, it's a very special show and really a lot of fun. And, and when I first did it, when Troy had the initial concept, and it was a very different format at the time, but the basic of it was, was the same. And I did it, and I was watching the audience going, this audience looks like they're, they're at like a sporting event. They're, so, they're like on the edges of their seats. And then as I was doing it, I was like, I just never felt this. I mean, I've done thousands and thousands and thousands of shows. I've never felt what I'm feeling right now. And, and that's what made me absolutely fall in love with the show. It's a unique experience for the audience and the performers. And there are some who take to it, like, you know, amazingly well. Like Rick Olverton is somebody who just, he loves challenges. And, oh, and he'll just keep that. going until he conquers it. And his mind is so fast. You know, Greg Proops does it all the time. And it's just magnificent and and and. You know, and the series that we did for the UK, we shot it in, uh, we shot some shows in London, some shows in San Francisco, some shows in LA. And everybody, Robin Williams to, you know, Gilbert Gottfried, we had Fred Willard, uh, Hannibal Burris, uh, Maria Bamford, uh, you know, Greg Proops, uh, Rich Hall, who's, who Americans know for, as the Sniglets guy, but he's actually made a monstrous career for himself in the UK, which is why you go, hey, whatever happened to him? Well, yeah. he's living large. Um, good, uh, good for him. Just Eddie Pepitone, Kira Sultanovich. Uh, yeah, you've, you've got a, a, a roster of who's who in comedy. And they all love, and the beauty of it is, when you're waiting to go on for set list, it doesn't matter if you're Robin Williams or you're me or you're you or you're some guy nobody ever heard of or never knew. You're all the same when you're waiting to go on for set list. <laughs> yeah, except you've got your minds as opposed to the average person. But uh, in, and I say that lovingly because you guys are all, you know, you're where you're at for a reason. You, you know, I, I always thought that Emo Phillips was somebody who just, I always imagined that Emo Phillips like crafted every funny thing he ever said within an inch of its life. I always felt like it was, it's so idiosyncratic and so particular to Emo and such an original, unique perspective on everything. It's so smart and so well crafted. I always thought this stuff is like, he must work like a, like a lab technician on this stuff. And then he did set list and I realized, Oh no, that's Emo. He does yeah. that. That just, happens for emo he did a joke at one point uh, this outside of set list he did a joke and i said to him i said that has to be that is an amazingly constructed joke i go how long did you work on that and he goes yeah that was a tough one that one took like a couple of hours and i wanted to punch him right in the nose <laughs> it was, it's it's funny though people don't realize how hard comedians you guys do work on on your jokes on your acts on, on what, you know, people go like, oh man, they just go up there and they talk and they're funny. And, you know, whether it be you or Eddie Murphy or Rick Overton or whomever, people, people that are generally funny and entertaining have worked hard at what they do. This is not just a uh, overnight sensation this isn't just like you go up on stage and you wing it there's been a process for each of you and each of you has a different process because yeah. there, is, there is no set process you know yeah. and what the work day never ends well no definitely not no it, it in any art it doesn't it, and that's the thing is the hour and a half that you're on stage performing is the least hard work Yes, yeah, it's funny that you say that, but it's true. It's kind of like doing a play. You yep. do the play, 
people don't realize you've rehearsed for three months, you know, be it on Broadway or whatever. And I remember I had plays where I had to change my entire lifestyle to be able to physically do what I needed to do for, you know, 90 minutes on stage at night. You know, I had to change the times that I ate, the kind of food that I ate, mm -hmm. how I sleep when I woke up, how, you know, what my day consisted of, because there were some, you know, physical and, and just energy challenges in the, in the play. And it's like, you really have to modify your life to be at your peak to do the things you need to do in any given performance. Really interesting. That's, that's something you take away from the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. <laughs> it's, it's something that kind of like just strikes me. It, it's like, uh, you know, you're taught that, and hopefully it becomes ingrained. You're taught when you've got to change everything sometimes for a role. And, yeah. you, you know, there are some actors, and I've experienced them, who like get so into their character and on set or whenever, that's all they are, even when you're not shooting. Right, yeah. And I had, you know, an experience with um, uh, Sissy Spacek. Um, I did a, a small part on Night Mother. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It uh -huh. was a Broadway play way back in the day uh, by Marsha Norman mm -hmm. and someone else. But anyway... Uh, Sissy Spacek and Anne Bancroft bought the rights and to do a movie, to do the movie. And it's a two-woman play. But for the movie, they added a family just for something different. Yeah, to, op to open it up. Yes, exactly. So like at the very beginning of the movie, uh, myself and a woman playing my wife and, and two kids – you know, we, we had a scene uh, with, um, with uh, Sissy Spacek. And Sissy, the day before we shot, or two days before we shot, we did stills for them to put up in the house. And when we went in to meet uh, Anne Bancroft and Sissy Spacek, Anne Bancroft, I, I went over to her and I introduced myself. I said, uh, Miss Bancroft, my name is Eddie Burke. I'm playing Dawson, your son. And she goes, Dawson. She is like, you know, this big, open hearted woman, just a tremendous energy or whatever. And Sissy Spacek just stood there, not, didn't say a word, didn't do anything. And so, you know, I took it as I'm not going to go over and bother her. She doesn't want to be bothered. Right. So we, we, we shoot the scene one day and it's over and the woman playing my wife and myself are standing waiting for the, uh, uh, for the trot, whatever, the van to take us back to our cars. And out of the blue comes Sissy Spacek. And Sissy Spacek goes like, I want you guys to know you were wonderful. Thank you so much. And please understand that when I work, I try to stay in character the entire time on set, no matter what I'm doing. So please don't think that I was rude to you or whatever. And, you know, which she did not have to do or say, but my, my po real point is that some actors have to be that way. Yeah, that, yeah. Everybody's different. Everybody's got, yeah, everybody's different. And it's really, you, you really have to, uh, it took me a long time to realize that actually. And, and you have to respect everybody's process and who they are and yes. stuff. It, yeah, for a lot of people, it's pretty fragile too. But here's a great story about that. Um, this was a uh, Tony Roberts story. You know Tony Roberts, the actor? Tony Roberts? Sure. Yeah, sure. The great Tony Roberts. He told a story about his first time in a Broadway show. And I don't remember what show it was. And I don't remember who this actor was that he was working with. But it was one of the great English actors like Ralph Richardson or Laurence Olivier or, or somebody like that. And um, he said he was 
working with this, you know, elder statesman thespian of great renown and respect. And he said, the guy was so mean. And the guy was like, he, th he they thought, you know, he look at him and the guy would just would have the scowl on his face whenever he spoke or, you know, and he was just, he just treated him awfully. And, and Tony Roberts said, he's just like, I just stayed away from him. You know, I just got a bad vibe. And I was like, you know, I'll just get through this. And, you know, okay. And he said, opening night, he's about to go on for his first scene, first time ever in a Broadway show before an audience starring with this great Englishman actor. And he said, he's getting ready, he's in the wings, waiting to go on. And he feels the presence of this guy behind him. He turns and looks at him and the guy is just looking, you know, he's like right over his shoulder, looking past him, not even acknowledging him, looking at the stage from the wings. And he says to him, your first time on Broadway, dear boy. And Tony Roberts goes, yeah, yes it is. And the guy goes, well, and he pats him on the shoulder and says, don't worry about your hands, and turns and walks away, <laughs> just as he has to go on. And he, he said the whole, the whole thing that he was feeling was this old thespian setting him up for that moment, which is the funniest fucking thing you can do to anybody. <laughs> that is hilarious. That, don't yeah. worry about your hands. Ah! <laughs> that, boy, that you... Uh, you I can't imagine what alone. Roberts felt. Was, I know. He like he, he had to go like, holy shit! What what am I gonna do about my hands? <laughs> oh, that's hilarious, Paul! I want to thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. You are always. Got to be honest. I've known you, Eddie, for well over thirty five years now. At this point, yep. I don't know exactly how many years it is, but I think this may be the most fun conversation you and I have ever had because there's nobody else at the bar asking for you to come and give them some shit. We can get to talk. Right. This is fun, man. Yeah. I appreciate it. That's one of the reasons. It's funny. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast to begin uh, with because in the, <clears throat> you know, you know me as a bartender. I know you as a comedian and we can sit and talk and be other people, not, but be real people yeah. instead of just like, one-dimensional bartender, whatever. Uh, well, when I'm there to hang out, you know, I can play around, but you're working. So, you yeah. know, you know we're so this has really been fun. For all the years that I've known you, this is the most fun conversation I've had. And, it's, and it has been a privilege and an honor to know you for as long as I have. Your presence at the improv, still to this day, when I walk in, you know, so, many, so much has changed. And, and, and it's not the same kind of, comfortable homey family place that it was for so many of us for so long and that's just life and you know no problem with any of that but the feeling i get when i walk in and i go there's eddie man there's eddie this was fucking this is still real this is still part of my life in a well, special you. way uh, I, you I you and that. antonio the bus boy mm -hmm makes my heart soar every time I walk in. And sometimes, you know, there, there were years and years went by where I, I didn't walk into the club. Um, uh, and I walk in and I see you and I see Antonio and, I, and it's 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And I, I still feel like, okay, this is still, this is still family, no matter how different it feels. Well, you're, you're right. And thank you so much for that because it, it means a lot. You know, I, uh, when they, uh, had my 40th anniversary party. Yeah, it was great. I was really happy to see you be celebrated like that, man, because you're one of those people that, that you one, know. One of the like, things that I said and is so true for me is that, you know, it, it's been so nice to be part of the world of comedy, not being a comedian and knowing all the comedians and knowing all you guys. You know, it, it's been it's been wonderful because, you know, comedians like everybody else are, are people and most, most people are nice. And that's the same with comedians. Sure. There's the occasional dick, but that's life. You know, there's always right. that person. Right. But in general, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for being allowed to, to be part of that community. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, know, you are. You, and you are part of that community because, uh, uh, yeah, you're there, you know, before and after we get on stage, you're, you're there. And, and, uh, yeah, it's part of, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, uh, I believe you were the one who was 
pumping coffee. There was a night when I was uh, one of a couple of people trying to sober up Mr. Johnny Carson, and you were oh, pumping him. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that was me, yeah. <laughs> we had some experiences together that really belong in some kind of a book. But I was trying to sober up Johnny Carson so he doesn't get a DUI. <laughs> that, yeah. Was that the night Bruce Smirnoff was there? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That definitely was. Uh, Paul, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much. But before you go, I want to give you a little present, which is one of my t-shirts. Sweet. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. I'm going to send this to you and you'll give me your address off the air and yeah. I will send it out to you. And I just can't thank you enough. You were just phenomenal. We could go on for hours. I mean, it's it just there's so many things to talk about, but, you know, we can't go on for hours. <laughs> but, again, thank you so we'll much. We'll do it again sometime. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to do it again. All right. Thank you, my friend. Good hanging. Thank you. Same All here. Right. I'll see you soon. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Until next time, I will see you. Everybody stay healthy. Wear those damn masks. And peace out.